Srila Prabhupada received critical acclaim from various Western scholars from top universities across the globe. However, after his mysterious departure, there has been literally thousands of changes done to the Bhagavad Gita, effectively making it a different book and completely silencing Srila Prabhupada's unique writer's voice. Changes are being made to most of Prabhupada's books. They plan to continue to do so with no end in sight. These excessive and unnecessary changes are rejected by scripture when it tells us that such literature, even though irregularly composed, is heard, sung, and accepted by the purified men who are thoroughly honest. One of the most blatant changes is found in the Chaitanya Chetamrita Madhya Lila, chapter 19, verse 157. In the original purport by Prabhupada, it reads, if one thinks that there are many pseudo-devotees or non-devotees in the Krishna Consciousness Society, one can keep direct company with the spiritual master. In contrast, the new revised and enlarged version has the opposite message. Even if one thinks that there are many pseudo-devotees or non-devotees in the Krishna Consciousness Society, still one should stick to the society. Redundant to say the least, repugnant to be more precise. The scheme points towards accepting the authority of the institution no matter what. Taking just one example from the Bhagavad Gita further exposes the agenda behind such unauthorized changes. Chapter 2, verse 8, purported by Prabhupada, they can achieve real happiness only if they consult Krishna or the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam which constitute the signs of Krishna or the bona fide representative of Krishna, the man in Krishna consciousness. And now the new edition says, they can achieve real happiness only if they consult Krishna or the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, which constitute the signs of Krishna to the bona fide representative of Krishna, the man in Krishna consciousness. Once again, we are reminded that we must submit to these self-appointed so-called gurus. Thankfully, Srila Prabhupada forewarned us when one year before his departure he wrote, A little learning is dangerous, especially for the Westerners. I am practically seeing that as soon as they begin to learn a little Sanskrit, immediately they feel that they have become more than their guru, and then the policy is kill guru and be killed himself. And yet, this is the excuse the person behind these changes used in 1983. The Sanskrit editors were by now accomplished scholars, and now they were able to see their way through perplexities in the manuscript by consulting the same Sanskrit commentaries Srila Prabhupada consulted when writing Bhagavad Gita as it is. Meet J. Israel, also known as Jayadvaita Swami, the person behind the book changes and a constant defender against Srila Prabhupada. Another so-called editor had this to say, even though I might be able to tolerate reading it, for everything from Prabhupada is of course ecstatic, it still contains too many mistakes for me to read it without curling my toes and become irritated. However, within the past two years, devotees who assisted Srila Prabhupada in the creation of his original books and who were very close to him have begun to speak up against the changes. Here are the testimonies where it will become clear just how adamantly opposed Srila Prabhupada is to any changes done to his books. Prabhupada was in his room and I came up and we started off by showing him the drawings of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. And one by one, by one, Prabhupada was commenting and rejecting them for various reasons. Prabhupada liked the original drawings as simple as they were that had been done by Govinda Dasi and Gorsundar. These drawings, while technically, I think, superior, lacked in so many ways, according to Srila Prabhupada. In one drawing, the Goswamis, Rupa and Sanatan, were absent. In another drawing, one of the Goswamis was sitting on the same level as Lord Chaitanya. I mean, on and on, Prabhupada would tear apart these drawings 
And as he kept going through them, he was getting angry. Now, I don't know if any devotee had ever seen Srila Prabhupada angry before. I certainly had not. So it was, it was a shock and it was scary and it was... I was very frightened. <laughs> and... It, the conclusion was we weren't going to use any of those drawings. So then I had to now bring out the Krishna book and start to show Prabhupada the paintings that the artists wanted to take out and the press devotees wanted to take out and the new ones that they wanted to insert. So I introduced the topic and Prabhupada said, they want to add paintings? I said, no, Srila Prabhupada, they want to replace paintings, not add. In some cases, they are the same scene, they think they painted it better. In other cases, they want to replace, they want to take out paintings that they think were painted too long ago and they're not painted in a serious way and insert other paintings, not of the same Leela, but just because they're technique, technically better. Prabhupada said, what? You have no authority to do that. You have no authority here. Once a painting has been approved, you can't remove it. If you want to repaint that pastime, and if the new painting is better, shows more detail, shows more Leela, more character, uh, that might be considered. But just to take one painting out, to put a different one in, no, you cannot do that. He said, once I have approved something in my books, it is eternal. Once a painting is approved, it is eternal. You have no authority. I said, oh, okay. So I said, do, do you want me to show you what they're proposing? And very unhappily, he said, okay. So I started to show Srila Prabhupada the paintings, one by one, that they wanted to insert. One of them was a painting of Krishna killing Putana. Now we had a painting of Krishna killing Putana, so this, I think, would have fit the category of we're taking an old one out and putting in a better one. Prabhupada looked at it. He made a face. And Prabhupada said, that is an ugly black mass. That is not superior. Rejected. Okay. And on and on, I showed Prabhupada a painting of Krishna sitting on the rocks, which I thought was beautiful. Prabhupada thought his hair was too long and wild. Rejected. And besides, you want to take, you don't want to add, you want to take out a painting that I have already approved for that? No, rejected. And as I kept showing Srila Prabhupada these paintings, the anger that had started with the line drawings for TLC had grown to almost like roaring proportions. At one point he was pounding his fist on the desk saying, this is what I'm afraid of, that you will make changes in my books that will ruin them. No, you have to get permission. You cannot do this. So finally, I had one last painting to show Srila Prabhupada. I said, Prabhupada, they want to take out the painting of the Ras Lila and insert this new painting of the Ras Lila that appeared in the third canto. Prabhupada didn't say a word for a moment. From his sitting room, he can look into his bedroom where he sees this beautiful painting of the original Ras Lila that Devahuti did hanging on his wall. So he's looking at that painting then he looks back at the print of the painting that, I wanted, that we wanted to put in his book. I said, you think this is better? This is a hippie dance. Their heads are not covered. Krishna's hair is wild. The gopi's hair is wild. Hippie seeds. Hippie dance. Rascals. They're all rascals. Prabhupada was so angry. He was banging his fist and yelling at me. At that time, his servant Sudama uh, came running in because he heard the yelling. He couldn't imagine what it was. He opens the door. He sees Prabhupada like Nishringadev. He couldn't even get down to offer his obeisances. He was so terrified. He stood in the doorway. On one foot, he lifted himself up 
with his other foot and covered his eyes. He couldn't bear to see the scene. And then Prabhupada said to me, get out. And he threw us both out. It was the first of many lessons that Prabhupada gave me about making changes in his book. When he would talk about Krishna, I would temporarily forget who I was, where I was, and what I was doing. I would just be wrapped. And then when he would stop talking, I would be like, oh yeah, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm here, I'm, my name is uh, such and such. And we all had that experience, I think, I think you know what I mean. His words, his ability to bring transcendental sound into this material creation was his greatest gift. He was able to connect us with the spiritual world by that communication. And that communication went into his books. He didn't write his books, he spoke his books. Every morning he would get up at two in the morning, sometimes earlier, and he would sit at the dictaphone and he would speak. He would speak into the microphone and you'd hear the little clicking sound. And sometimes I would sit outside the door, but I would sometimes sit outside and listen to him translating his books. And I would peek in and it was like another world was going on. There was another a dimension, an alternate reality that was existing in, around him that I didn't see with these eyes, but that I could feel. And we all glimpsed it. Whether we glimpsed it one time or more than one time, we all glimpsed it. One time in Boston, we had these big keyholes, you know, those old-fashioned keyholes. And I used to, uh, I didn't want to bother him, so I would peek in the keyhole to see if he needed anything. I could usually tell if he needed water, if he needed something. So I would just peek in the keyhole. And I remember one time I had this overwhelming experience. You know, like Mother Yashoda looking at Krishna's mouth or something like that, you know? Peeked in the keyhole and he was sitting and with the Bhagavatam open, singing, singing the verses and just dramatically uh, chanting and talking and and I for a few moments I realized he's not alone in there um, there's demigods or there's beings I can't see and I remember going wow I'm living in this house I cooking the meals and cleaning the floors and doing the laundry but I haven't got a clue who he really is I remember telling Satsarup, we don't know who he is. We have no idea who he is. And I think that that's something we really need to revive in our ISKCON movement, is who Srila Prabhupada really is, the divinity that he really is, the, the, the dimension that he came from. He often said, I wrote these, I didn't write these books, Krishna wrote these books. And this is so true. This is, this is a, he didn't actually write them. You have to understand he spoke them. Early, before he came from India, he might have written, he did. But once he was with us, he had a dictaphone from day one. And that dictaphone was his treasure. What I wanted to stress is his, uh, his Vani, his, the mystic qualities of Srila Prabhupada and the fact that what he spoke is sacred, can't be changed, can't be altered, can't be improved upon. I personally made the mistake of trying to correct him once. <clears throat> yeah, what happened was it was very, it was with, with good intentions. But sometimes things with good intentions don't work out that way. And he was going to be speaking the Brahma Samhita, mm, 
the materialistic demeanor cannot possibly stretch to the transcendental, you know, you know, uh, you know what I mean, to the transcendental autocrat, that from Brahma Samhita, which his spiritual master had spoken, and which he adamantly said, don't even change a comma of that. Don't touch it, because it's called Arsha Prayog. You never touch the speech or the writings of the Acharya. It's opera. So, because he was going to be speaking this on a record album, I wanted him to put his best foot forward. I had a kind of a motherly feeling there. I did, didn't I? And um, he, pronounced, uh, he pronounced analogously, analogously. Because I typed it up, then he read it to me a couple of times to practice. We were going to record it at the studio. You remember that? Yeah. Remember we went to record it? Okay. So before we went, he had it written and he read it to me and I listened and you know, the, you know how he's practicing. And I finally I said, Srila Prabhupada, actually I think that word is pronounced analogously. He flashed fire in his eyes and he said, you pronounce it your way, and I'll pronounce it my way. And guess what? He pronounced it analogously. Anybody can listen to that record album. And that's, I think that was a British pronunciation, but I was unaware of it, perhaps. Anyway, I, um, I learned the hard way. And I think this is something that we really need to address in ISKCON now, is Srila Prabhupada's books. They have to remain as he spoke them because the sound vibration is sacred. And what's so miraculous, which I consider incredibly miraculous, is that within, just recently, within the last year, a 320-something page transcript that was thought to have been burned in a fire long, long ago, some 30 years ago, suddenly resurfaced. It was just lost at, at the archives. Nobody knew it was there. And it was uh, full, it's full of nectar. Uh, it was tr Rameshwar's transcript for the, uh, for the book, uh, for the Lilamrita. This is it. I had it printed out. But there are some very, very significant points about the books that, that are made. And this is long, long, you gotta realize this is long before there was ever any kind of a BBT edit or book editing issue or any of this. None of this existed at that time. We just had Prabhupada's books. We were happy, satisfied. We had, we, there was no anticipation of this. But remember, Srila Prabhupada has mystic opulences. He could foresee all this easily. He could foresee that his books would be changed. And he also made plenty of arrangements in advance by multiple levels of instructions not to change a word. And even you can read uh, how uh, so many experiences that uh, even if a change seemed logical, Rameshwar writes in his uh, in his memoirs, even if a change seemed logical, um, Prabhupada would tell him not to change it in a way of training him not to do it because Prabhupada could foresee all this. He foresaw everything. And not only that, he's still watching over this movement. I have no doubt about it. He's well aware of what's going on right now. And I see this, 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 uh, this transcript, which I recommend everyone read, there's tons of nectar about Srila Prabhupada in it, just incredible. I recommend everyone read it, and I think that it's almost like he reached his hand out for a samadhi and said, hey, are you guys, I gotta remind you of a few things. I gotta remind you that this is what I wanted done for my books. This is what I had in mind. And of course, Rameshwar has been gone for many years. He has no position or political 
a lot of what's going on here is people are afraid to speak, but almost all of Prabhupada's disciples are in agreement that they want the original books. Almost all of them. I had no taste for Prabhupada's books, but I opened one one day and I started reading it. I said, wait a minute, I have to start all over again. I have to go back to Srimad Bhagavatam and start reading it from the first chapter. And then I realized as I was reading it that I'd never read any of these things before. So I started reading the books again, the Bhagavatam. I'm up to about the middle of the 10th canto now. And I noticed a a few weeks ago, I was about half, halfway into the first volume of it, and the tone started changing. It was like, wow, this is, there's not very many commentaries, and they, the, the flavor of Prabhupada isn't there. And then I went back to the introduction and read, well, Prabhupada passed away before he finished the tenth canto, so his students wrote the rest. And it, Prabhupada's lost. The flavor of Prabhupada was lost in, in the rest. The flavor of Prabhupada in the juice is gone. The mystic opulence. I don't know what it is, but when you read Prabhupada, his purports and, and his translations, they're different than any other writer. So I agree, you can't change these. You can't change this. Whatever he said in the beginning is, is there. I think, so far as the Krishna book is concerned, uh, there in this manuscript, this transcript, there's very explicit instructions by Srila Prabhupada about how he wanted the Krishna book printed. <coughs> and um, even though it uh, doesn't make sense to have it that size because of the cost of printing, when uh, Rameshwar tries to suggest that they make it smaller, Prabhupada practically throws him out of his room. There's a few other things like that in there. My point is that he didn't want changes to... He, he attended to every facet of his books. This is my point. An, another point is that he wanted the books, the Bhagavatams, to have about 400 pages. He actually printed those in India before he came. And it costs a lot more to do it that way. But he had in mind a very clear picture of what he wanted his books to look like. This is so important. This is something we really need to know about. And what's so remarkable is it's all delineated in this transcript. I, there were things I didn't know about. One of the things he said was that the ISKCON press is the heart of, the press is the heart of ISKCON and the art department is the heart of the press. Because the paintings, and this is something that uh, Rameshwar brought to my attention, because I'm an artist also, that the paintings are his, he said, these are our trademarks. We, we attract people by these incredible paintings that most other philosophy books are just to print, nothing but print, right? But Prabhupada had all, had all these incredible pictures put in, and he designed those pictures in detail. I know, I was an artist. He stood over my shoulder while I was doing the one for the Gita, literally telling me how to do it. And for teachings of Lord, Ch we were living in, in, in his apartment at that time. Gorsuner and I were traveling with him. And for teachings of Lord Chaitanya, the five p drawings that I did for that, and Gorsundar also helped me, you know, we worked together, we worked on the same picture, so, um, uh, but he, he did the composition. Prabhupada designed the composition, told us what to draw, told us how to do it, and now um, uh, people seem to think that the paintings can be changed. He made it so clear. No pictures can be taken out of my books. He said it again and again and again and again and again. And they can't be changed. Incidentally, just last week, on August 10th, 2015, Mother Govinda Dasi wrote the following on Facebook. Yes, although the books were massively edited, literally rewritten, most of Prabhupada's disciples were unaware of these changes because they all had their own books, the original editions. 
Up until recently, many of his disciples were unaware of this, and even now, many devotees have no idea that they are actually not reading Srila Prabhupada's books at all. In fact, they are reading, selling, and distributing Jayadvaita's BBTI version of Prabhupada's books. Anyone who takes the time to look at the differences will be shocked and appalled at the changes. I purchased a later edition Bhagavad Gita as it is from a local Krishna center. When I took it home, opened it up and began to read, I recall my first response was, What the hell happened to this book? That was my first response. It sounded nothing at all like Srila Prabhupada's writing. His writer's voice was missing. The book had been purged of the familiar sound of Srila Prabhupada's voice, leaving only a glimmer of the beauty that once was. Every author knows that he has a writer's voice, and working with an editor, there is much more taken in not losing the sound of his voice, his mood, and his mindset. The many years of lectures on the Bhagavad Gita, the sound of Prabhupada's voice speaking each verse, and discussing the purports, all this is lost in these new editions. The new Gita is half a loaf. Reading it, you may not starve, but you won't be fulfilled as by reading and hearing the actual voice of Srila Prabhupada. The BBTI is an imposter organization that has nothing to do with Srila Prabhupada's original Bhaktivedanta Book Trust, or BBT. In 1995, they tried to steal the copyrights to Srila Prabhupada's books by claiming that his work, his purports, and the artwork were all works for hire. To finalize, Here's Jay Israel giving us a glimpse into his mental hell. This is a person who said that there are warts in Srila Prabhupada's books. Basically, morning, Samsara Dava, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Hare Krishna, nothing else. Evening, Gorarti, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Hare Krishna, nothing else. Nothing else. Pretty clear. The devotee is asking whether after Samsara Dava we should chant Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra. Interesting question. When Prabhupada chanted in the morning, he chanted Samsara Dava, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Hare Krishna and nothing else. He didn't chant the Pranam Mantra to his Guru Maharaj. Now if I suggest that we shouldn't chant Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra, there'll be a revolution. But actually it's not necessary. It's not what he did. And we don't have to. Samsara Dava, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Hare Krishna, nothing else. So when someone who's not Prabhupada's direct disciple begins by offering pranam mantras to Prabhupada, my, my hearing takes a beating. I, I think, what's wrong with this person? But at least don't start with Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra. You're totally contrary to the tradition if you do that. The next thing that disturbs me, sometimes we hear right in the middle of Samsara Dava. Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya. What the hell is that? Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya. What the hell is that? <laughs> Samsara Dava is not the Prabhupada song. It's the Guru song, which doesn't mean the founder Acharya of his kind. Samsara Dava is not 
the Prabhupada song. And therefore it even disturbs me when, you know, they finish the, the uh, Jayam Stuvam Stasya Yashastri Sandham Bande Guru Sri Charanada Vindam Jaya Prabhu Pada Jaya Prabhu Jaya Prabhu Pada Jaya Prabhu as if again it was the Prabhupada song. If you want to think of Prabhupada during that song, that's fine. If you want to think of Prabhupada during that song, that's fine. But it's not. But what if somebody else is thinking of his guru? God forbid. God forbid. Then you've spoiled his meditation. You, 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 because you're thinking it's the Prabhupada song. You, 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 because you're thinking it's the Prabhupada song. You don't need to chant Jai Prabhupada, Jai Prabhupada at any point. You don't need to chant Jai Prabhupada, Jai Prabhupada at any point. You don't need to chant Jai Prabhupada, Jai Prabhupada at any point. Samsara Dava, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Hare Krishna, nothing else. And, all right, I won't buck the system. After Samsara, after, after Samsara Dava, Srila Prabhupada's Pranam Mantras. And if you left them out, you would not be wrong. You would be institutionally wrong, but you would not be philosophically wrong. Because Prabhupada said, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Samsara Dava, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Hare Krishna, nothing else. That's what he did. And if that's what you do, you're no worse than he was. And he was perfect. And he was perfect. We think warmth and smiles convey honesty, sincerity, but a trained lie spotter can spot a fake smile a mile away. Can you all spot the fake smile here? You can consciously contract the muscles in your cheeks, but the real smiles in the eyes, the crow's feet of the eyes, they cannot be consciously contracted. And he was perfect. So again, I'm not campaigning to edit it out of the program, but keep it at that, if you would. Or to put it another way, I would be happy if you would keep it at that. And others may consider what's best to do. And others may consider what's best to do. Is that clear? Does that answer your question? <laughs>